Hello, beautiful teachers. Welcome to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. It is a pleasure to be back with you again, and I hope you're doing fantastic today. Do let me know in the comments what's going on with you in your studio and what news you have and what takeaways you've had from recent in-person or online trainings or events you've attended for teachers. What are the things that have really stuck with you? Even if it was a few months ago, sometimes there's those little nuggets of wisdom that stick with you for several months after. Before we get there, just a little bit of news. So if you haven't heard already, we are running an event this summer in Cincinnati, Ohio. So if you can make it to Cincinnati, Ohio on the 20th and 21st of July, I really hope you'll check it out. The link is vibrantmusicteaching.com slash TT because we call it the Teacher Turbo Boost. So TT24 for this year, vibrantmusicteaching.com slash TT24 and you can see all the details there. I know not everyone can make it to Ohio, okay? I had to pick a spot in the world. I'll try and pick a different spot next time if I can. But this is the one that we're able to do this summer and I cannot wait. It's going to be so much fun. I mean, you can see already on the page some of the fun things we're doing, but there are secrets behind the scenes as well <laughs> that um, you may re you may learn along the way or you may only see at the event. There's little fun surprises, of course, to keep things just so that we have an amazing time together. We're going to learn a lot, yes, but we're also going to have a lot of fun, so it should be a great weekend. Again, that's July 20th and 21st. We have just a few super early bird tickets remaining. So we have a limited number of those. There's a few remaining. They'll go away no matter what at the end of April. They're expiring at the end of April, but we may run out before that. So do get on that and see if you can make plans to come to Cincinnati in July and get your ticket and get it all sorted at the best possible price. I have been a busy bee over the last couple of weeks, organizing a lot of stuff for um, the membership and different places, games and different things I need to do while I'm off teaching and have a bit more time to play with. And one of the things I've been working on over the Easter break, I want to give you an insider info about, I haven't announced this anywhere, but I'm going to be releasing a course about pedaling. And I've had a few questions about pedaling recently that have inspired this. It's not, it is absolutely not the super advanced intricacies of pedaling. What this is, is I haven't found a resource out there that I can refer people to for how to teach students the basics of getting to good solid legato pedaling. And there are tricks and things that you pick up from various different teachers and that's what I've picked up and it's really a sequence that I follow and students never have any problem anymore. But I remember when it was so difficult. So I've put together that course. We're hopefully going to be releasing it relatively soon, um, maybe next month or possibly June. So yeah, just wanted to give you that little bit of info so you can look forward to that course if you're a member of Vibrant Music Teaching. With that being said, let's dive into our main topic of today, which is all about the MTNA conference and what I'm taking away from it. So if you don't know what I'm talking about with the MTNA conference, when I say that, if you're outside of the US, you may not have heard of it. Even within the US, some people won't have heard of it because we're all independent teachers and we don't always come across the same things. So MTNA stands for Music Teachers National Association and it means national of the USA. And they hold their conference in March every year and it moves every single year. So this year it was in Atlanta in Georgia and it's only the second time I've attended MTNA. I've been to the other big US conference uh, relevant to piano teachers, which is called NCKP. And it's just outside Chicago. I've been there m many more times. <laughs> um, quite a few times over the years because it's in July. So it it's generally when we're off teaching, so it's a little bit easier, but it's really fun to attend both of them and they have different vibes. And yeah, it's great that I've been able to attend MTNA the last two years. Pam, just to quickly answer your question. It is uh, vibrantmusicteaching.com slash TT24 if you want to type that in or the link is in the description as well. So that's for our own conference. 
But back to MTNA. So this was my second one that I was attending and I've put together some of my takeaways. Now there's always loads of different things going on and MTNA, because this year we had our own booth and everything, I'm kind of running around and doing a lot of different things. So I don't get to attend as many sessions as I used to, but I do make an effort to attend a few every day and make sure that I kind of mix it up and do different things and have conversations with different teachers as well, as well which is fantastic. So my first takeaway and my second takeaway are actually from the same session. And this was a session I attended with the Bastions. So it was actually a showcase. And the showcases, if you're not familiar with these conferences, are paid sessions, meaning like we did one as well for VMT, meaning a, a publisher or a company of some sort purchases a slot. You pay to have that session and you're allowed to talk in a promotional way about your, your product or your service or whatever it is you provide. And they're always at either 8 a.m. <laughs> or 1 p.m. So they're not the most desirable slots in the day. But in the rest of the sessions, there's not supposed to be any promotion. So that's the difference. However, just because they're, they're promotional doesn't make them not educational. And I went to this great session with the Bastions. So it's two sisters who are the Bastions um, and they both write music and they had just published these books or maybe they weren't even new, I'm not sure. Um, but they're technique books that are meant to go along with any method book. And so they were talking a lot about technique. And there's two little tidbits I picked up from them. One of which I already sort of knew. And the other one, I just had never heard in that way before. So I'll start with the one I already sort of knew and just need to prioritize more. So, and that is counting in before you play. They showed a lot of videos of their students in their lessons, which was great. I love it when, especially with something like technique, when they utilize video so you can see real students, not polished perfectionism, perfection, but real students and not a teacher imitating a student because that's not, you know, if you've tried to imitate bad technique, we can't always do it. <laughs> and therefore showing the correction doesn't always mean as much. So they showed their students and I would say every time or almost every single time they've trained their students to count one bar, one measure before they start their piece. Simple, hard to get students to do. Something I've tried, but not been as consistent as I should have been about to actually get students to do. And where I think this would really make an impact in my teaching is it's very hard when we're training students for performance. One of the things we go over again and again is that before they play, so they sit with their hands in their lap when they get to the piano in a concert, they raise them onto the keys and they're supposed to listen to the first measure of their music or count themselves in before they play. But they don't and they especially don't do it under pressure. So in a performance situation, a lot of the time they skip that and they launch right in and that's where they make mistakes or get muddled or play too fast or something like that. I'm sure you've all seen this as well. So if I could implement this and be extremely consistent about every time they start playing, they have to count themselves in aloud and then maybe eventually they're allowed to do it in their head once they're beyond a certain level. I do think it would fix that problem. So consistency is always key with these kinds of things and that's something I haven't been consistent about. So let me know if you are. I'd love to hear from you if it's something you already do in your teaching or if this is brand new to you or you do it a bit like me, but not enough. The second thing I took from the Bastions though, I should have stickers for this. You're gonna have to imagine the stickers. Okay, so it's about wrist liftoffs. And I already have many different ways of describing wrist liftoffs and imagery that I use but this one was new to me, so I love it. They got smiley face stickers. You know, you can get them basically everywhere. Little stickers with smiley faces on them. They stick one smiley on the student's hand here. And this is key, I think, to making this work. They ask the student to name the smiley. So the student says, you say, what, what's this one called? George. 
Okay, so student names this one George. They stick the other s smiley, different color, on the fall board. And they say, what's that guy called? And the student said, actually, that's a girl. Her name is Frederica. Okay, so now at the end of each slur, George is going to say hi to Frederica. And so George goes up to say hi to Frederica. It was just a new way of describing the motion of the wrist going forward and up, right? Because that's often when we say forward, or especially if you're doing this online, I think this would be incredibly useful because it's so hard to describe to a student which way your wrist is going and get them to do it in a way that feels natural. And I just love this image. Let me know if it wasn't new to you because these things go around and I don't know whether it's Sebastian's invention or whether they heard it from someone else who heard it from someone else or you've heard it from someone else and we don't know the origin of these kinds of ideas, but I just love it. Whatever this name Smiley is called, saying hi to that Smiley and it has already made, I've used it so many times, both with students where I've had the smileys there and we've physically done it with younger students. But with older students, I just tell them to imagine it. Okay, imagine I stick a smiley sticker here and they tell me what it's called. And you know, we can do the same thing and they fully get it. I agree, it's brilliant. It's one of those things that you just never know what you'll pick up at these kinds of conferences. And especially, you know, it's a showcase session. They're really talking about their technique books and trying to sell them to you. Like that's what they're there to do but you pick up these amazing tricks if these sessions are put together well, which I love it. Um, yeah, Debbie, I hope you try it. I have tried it with loads of students and I can confirm it is a game changer for some students, especially those who are quite awkward with their movements or just have trouble with new movements. Getting George to say hi to Frederica at the end of every slur, because it's something I'm so bullish about in my studio. Like my students do get sick of me reminding them to have those slur endings because it's something I feel like I didn't learn early enough and something I see with a lot of transfer students is they come to me at a certain level and they're missing this. They never learned that a slur or a phrase line doesn't just mean play legato. It means do not play legato at the end of it. Lift and have that note be softer. Like those things are implied as well, but they're not always taught. And just changing that one thing in students playing can sometimes take it from being super dull and robotic to sounding like it has the beginnings of artistry to it, right? So love that. You never know what you're going to get. So those are my first two. They're both from the same session. Next one is from uh, my session, the session that I attended by Samantha Coates. So Samantha is one of my favorite, probably my favorite presenter in the world. <laughs> um, I hope she wouldn't blush hearing me say that. I hope she'd, yeah, but it's true. And you can tell the work she puts into her presentations. They're really polished and really fantastic. And she had a session about transfer students. And it was about them being a delight or a disaster, right? So Samantha loves taking on transfer students. And so she sees them as delight. And the session was trying to convince you to see them as a delight also and how we can help to achieve that if we want to have a better relationship with transfer students in our studio as a concept, right? <laughs> so that was her session. Now, the thing I picked up is actually not really to do with transfer students specifically. Sam has this she loves to use a matrix, okay? So she has lots of matrices in her presentations and they illustrate her points so well, I love them. One of the matrices that she shared, I'm not gonna describe this as well as if you just go to her blog, so you should definitely do that after listening to me here, okay? <laughs> so you should go look up Samantha's blog, which she's Blitz Books, and see the matrix there. But it's about, it's how she talks to parents about the effort that they're willing to put in and whether students are going to do things like exams or competitions or festivals or anything like that and having that conversation with parents. So she has these four quadrants 
and the parameters are support from the parents and no, I'm going to misquote this, so I'm not going to describe the whole thing because I'm going to mess it up. I know I am. But basically, it's a way of visually showing to the parents how their input and the time their child spends at the piano and how supportive they are during that time is going to impact their progress. So if they are very enthusiastic and supportive of their child's studies, but they are not able to find the time in their week to practice, they're going to make medium progress. And if they're not interested at all and they're not going to do any practice, obviously that's the worst possible option. But most parents aren't going to say that answer. The point of this, though, the, my takeaway is when I meet with parents, I'm chatting to them and I don't use any kind of reference, really. I mean, I show them around the studio, but I don't use any visual aids like this. And I do think bringing this into my meetings with new parents, various different visual aids to, and hopefully I'll design these during the summer <laughs> and then I can show them to you. But to demonstrate things that I talk about anyway, like our philosophy on exams or how we teach reading or how we teach a whole musician, you know, including improvisation and composition and everything. I think just having a few visual aids for those meetings could make a big impact and help these things stick even better for parents. So, and practice, for sure. Something to visually show them the impact it has of how supportive they are at home. So yeah, that was my takeaway. One of my takeaways from Samantha Coates' session. Um, number four is from the session I attended by Bradley Sowash. And this was about finding your groove, essentially, making your music sound more convincing, especially jazz, which is what Bradley specializes in. Now, I love hearing Bradley speak and I have picked up many of his Bradleyisms over the years and I try to always give him credit, but he just sometimes has the greatest turns of phrases that really when you can make something sound catchy it does get across to people in a new way like one of the ones i already knew from him which i love is when in doubt pent out meaning when you don't know what to improv what to do in your improv just play some notes from the pentatonic scale and everything will probably work itself out like you don't know what scale you're playing or what the chord relationship is just play some pentatonic notes and you'll probably get through it just fine so it's one I already knew, but this is a new one to me and I love it. I think it's my favorite one so far. The quote is from Bradley, if the beat's not steady, the tune's not ready. If the beat's not steady, the tune's not ready. I just love it. I think I might have to put it on a poster. I don't know about you, but getting this across to students, the fact that it rhymes just makes it stick a little bit more. Getting this across to students is so important. If the beat is not steady, the tune is not ready. And this is doubly true. I think I'm going to bring it out again and again when I'm talking about them preparing their duet pieces or ensemble pieces. If they have not practiced it to the point of the beat being incredibly steady, the tune is not ready to play with other musicians. It is not. And it, you know, even with a solo piece, that's true. If the beat's not steady, it's not ready for a performance at all. So just another one of those fantastic Bradley quotes that I love to collect. <laughs> I feel like I could fill a notebook with them someday. So let me know if you have a favorite Bradleyism, by the way. We've, we're four through my seven takeaways. I'd love to hear which one's standing out to you so far. I feel like the wrist liftoffs um, are, is one you're all going to carry through into your lessons with our little smiley face stickers. Number five, though, is on a completely different note. And I want your opinions on this. So I want your guesses. I don't have the answer to this, but I want your guesses, your estimates. What percentage of piano teachers do you think are women? That's what I want you to guess. What percentage of piano teachers are women? What would you guess, especially if you've attended conferences or even online trainings where you can see who else is in the room? How many piano teachers 
what percentage roughly do you think are women? Okay, Pam says 80%. Juliet said 85%. Don't let that influence you if you thought more or less. Go with your gut. Alison said 60. That's interesting. Lisa said 75. Okay, I'm going to let a few more guesses come through. I don't have the answer, which I couldn't. I can't survey all the teachers in the world. We do have a sampling. We haven't asked about gender, though, so on our report. Yeah, Deanna, I would tend to be with you. Margie said 65. Laura said 90. 84. I think if I average these, we'd get to somewhere in the 80s, actually. There's a few lower estimates like Margie and Alison. But I think on average, we'd say about 80 something. Okay. I would tend to say it's probably over 90% just based on, well, I have the data for my own members, so I can base it on that. But just based on a general feeling, I feel like it's at least 90%. So the reason I ask this is approximately, and I didn't learn this at the conference, I actually calculated it when I got home because I didn't spend my time with a calculator at the conference. But approximately 61% of the presenters were women. About 61%, that's what I've worked out from my program. Now I'm not here to bash the conference organizers or say anything, anything like that. But I do want us to think about that because I don't think it's representative of piano teachers. And I think these are all, this is all conjecture, okay? No one come at me looking for citations because I don't have them. This is all my estimation. But I feel like more, there's a higher percentage of piano teachers at the tertiary level in colleges and in institutions, bigger institutions, universities, conservatoires, that kind of thing. There's a higher percentage of those that are men from what I've witnessed. And I also think teachers at that level are more likely to submit proposals to conferences like this. I don't know why, but I would guess part of it is to do with confidence. So I wanted to bring this up just to encourage you out there. If you've ever thought of submitting a proposal, if you have an idea you'd like to share, you don't have to work at a college level. You don't even have to have a degree in music. I don't, and I've presented at these conferences. You don't have to be a blogger like me or anything like that. Anyone can present, anyone could submit a proposal. And I just want to encourage you to do that if it's something you think you might like to try. Because as I said, I'm not bashing the conference organizers. I doubt they intentionally picked more male proposals or that they even did as a percentage of the proposals they received, although it would be interesting to know. I'd say those are just, that's just roughly how they receive proposals. And if we go to another industry, 61% women sounds great. Sounds like we're beating the odds, right? Because in so many industries, they're shooting for 50-50. But we are predominantly women in the piano teaching industry. No one has said under 50%, right? No one has even, the lowest was 60. And these are guesses, so fair enough. But I just want to float it out there. If you're thinking about submitting, you've ever thought about it, I'd encourage you to give it a go. I think we need to have more representation of what's actually out there and especially of independent studio teachers because I think that is the majority of teachers as well. They're not in conservatoires and yet I would say I didn't do this analysis but if I went through the program I'd say there's a better representation of universities, university level teachers than regular teachers who teach out of their home or have a small school or that kind of thing. So just a little bit note of encouragement. Okay, number six, we're nearly there. This wasn't from a session and this isn't a new thing to me, but it's a reinforcement thing. And so is the last one actually. So I had a wonderful chat one of the days with Paul Myatt and Tim Topham. So the two Aussies, two of the Aussies who are there. Um, we were just having a general chat and this idea of competition and that kind of thing came up. 
And I've always believed in community over competition. Like we are a piano teaching community. So Tim also has a membership website. So does Paul. And yet we don't compete with each other. We collaborate. And I wanted to bring this to you all because again and again, I come back to this idea that we are a community and we need to raise each other up. So anytime you do feel like, and this is human, it's natural to feel like this, but if you have a local teacher near you who maybe you disagree with, or sometimes it's frustrating that they're so close by and you're competing for students or you feel like you are, let's try and think about it in a different way, if you can. And I understand it's not always possible, but can you try and see it as a community? Can you try and maybe reach out to that teacher, work together on something that promotes piano or music lessons as a concept, because then you're lifting both of you up. That's just one example. But I come back to this again and again, and every time I attend these conferences and in many other circumstances, that we are a community. We're not in competition with each other. We're in competition with all sorts of other things like other activities children and adults could be doing and technology zapping people's time and all sorts of other things, but not with each other. Not really. Okay. And on a similar note, number seven, my last takeaway, you need, especially when you feel like you're in a rut or you're not sure about continuing this teaching thing or maybe nothing as extreme as that, but you just feel a little bit of malaise. You need people, you need to be around people who inspire you. I mentioned Samantha Coates is one of my favorite presenters. Now I have many presenters that I love to see. But she is one of my favorites. And you need to be around people like that in the realm you're talking about. So if it's for you performing, you know, on your instrument. That's not a thing in my life. I only perform really at student recitals. It's not a big part of what I do or what I want to do. But if that's you, you need to be around people who inspire you to go further with that. And for me, seeing a great presenter is kind of like that because I want to be better and better at the things that I do. So not exclusive to teaching, although it's definitely true that if you go to these kinds of conferences and you're around teachers who inspire you, who teach the way you want to teach or do things you want to be able to do, or just that you admire, it inspires you to go further with what you're doing. So a general life lesson, but one that you can come back to again and again. Okay, just going to get to a few questions before we wrap up here. So Alison said, that's very interesting. In my teaching guild, the membership is almost 50% men. Okay, interesting. Where where did you say you're based, Alison? If I scroll up, did you say New Jersey? Okay, yeah, that is interesting. It's not what I see. But again, we all have a skewed, like bubbled perspective these days. So I'm aware that what I, the teachers who are in my membership or read our blog or whatever, are on this chat. Have we got any men with us today? I haven't seen any. You know, that's a skewed perspective and maybe they're following me or looking at things that I do are more likely to look at things that I do because I'm a woman. Less likely if they are men. I don't know. Uh, it's not that we have no male members, by the way. <laughs> We're not like a women membership. Just an interesting thing to look at. But is it that there are fewer women teachers? in New Jersey or in your area? Or is it that they're less likely to be in the teaching guild? And why? Just like to ask questions. <laughs> Don't always have the answers. Yes, something I believe in wholeheartedly and absolutely, Deanna. Um, yeah, most schools and studios. Interesting again, different, different parts of the world, but it doesn't feel representative. Where I bring it up mostly is when you're at these conferences and I've always thought that I've just never done the 
the adding up before. If you look around the room, you could kind of gauge <laughs> roughly what percentage are women. And it's not, probably not 90% at those conferences. But if you took away, especially the exhibit hall, the exhibitors, I feel like you'd get to 80% women. It's a guess like, anyway. I'm just spitballing. Laura, thank you for that. I'm glad it's made a difference for you and reinvigorated your teaching. I love that. It's fantastic to hear. So I don't think I, oh yes, Lisa had um, asked me for the visual matrices from Samantha Coates. Let me look up a link before we wrap up <laughs> so that everyone can get it, okay? Um, if I can think of the right words. Hopefully this will only take me two seconds. Yes. <laughs> I thought so. This is part two and I'll go back and get part one. So for people watching later, if you look up the progress matrix blitz books or Samantha Coates, either way, you should get that. Oh, that was the link to the PDF. So anyway, the part two will take you to the part one. So that's the link. But look up the progress matrix. That's what I was referring to and worried about misquoting and therefore didn't quote the exact thing <laughs> on the matrix. But looking at now, the two elements are practice to not much no practice and then support to not much no support. That's what I was trying to describe. So obviously if they do lots of practice and they have lots of support with their practice at home, then they're going to make the fastest progress. But look it up because uh, the article that goes along with this from Sam is fantastic. And in general, you should just follow what she writes because she's great. <laughs> um, Pam, any suggestions how to find other piano teachers that are inspirational? I had joined two local teachers association, but poorly supported and not very up to date. Yeah, it's tough. I would see if you can attend bigger conferences um, like the MTNA or even your you talk about local MTAs. So maybe your state level is where, because the more teachers you get together, the more likely you are to find the people who are like-minded in some way or are more of your ilk <laughs> in terms of teaching and how they do things or more forward thinking, etc. So if you're looking to meet people in person, maybe see if you can branch out and go a bit further. I know it gets expensive, so I know that's not always possible, but if possible. And otherwise, reach out online. Um, because, you know, there's communities like mine, Vibrant Music Teaching, like others, where you can meet with other teachers. I mean, asynchronously through our Facebook groups or our forums, but also we have regular meetups, for instance, in our group and many other groups do as well on Zoom. So you can chat with other like-minded teachers there in real time. So hopefully that helps. Thank you all so much for joining me. We're going to be back again next week. Same time, same place. In the meantime, if you want to check out our own event, meet other teachers in person that will definitely be creative and inspiring and engaged and fun, then you can check out our conference, which is happening in Cincinnati this July. It's at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash TT24. Hoping to see some of you there. And I'll see you back here next week. Bye everyone.